fog hat. Anyway, did you start recording then? Yeah. Are Do you we sure? Have... Welcome back. It's the 13 nights of Halloween. Do you have something to say then? Yes. Okay. It's better to burn out than and to fade, fade away. away. Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome to another episode of the 13 Nights of Halloween. Our 13th annual 13 Nights of Halloween. You sound tired. Are you tired? I am tired. Oh, well, a little bit. Yeah, it's getting kind of late. It's the witching hour now, so... Ooh. Little boys like you should be in bed. Um, okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Not getting in bed with little boys, sorry. <laughs> That's next week. But the witching hour, are you, um... Do you have any experience with witch witchery? I'm not going to say witchcraft, with witchery, because that's a cooler word. Yeah. I once knew a red witch that used to say the night is dark and full of terrors a lot. For the night is dark and full of terrors. Uh-huh. When I was a kid, we learned a Halloween carol called Stirring and Stirring and Stirring Our Brew. You would stand there and you'd move your arms like you were stirring your brew. And that's what the you're supposed to be the witches. And you'd sing, stirring and stirring and stirring our brew. Ooh, ooh. And that was, I think that was the whole song. And then you just say it again and again and again, unfortunately. Maybe that's not the case and I just don't remember any other words. There's not a lot of Halloween carols, though, unfortunately. There are some, I think. A few scary songs. But Halloween could really use some more songs. Yeah, I, I, see, I've had a Halloween playlist ever since there was such a thing as playlists, and it tends to Before be the same that, stuff. Before that, it was a Halloween mixtape. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> but it it's, tends to be the same stuff all the time. You know, like every Christmas... There's at least ten new Christmas albums. Now, granted, it's almost always the same songs over yeah, and over that's again. The unfortunate but part. you can find, you know, a new version of Winter Wonderland done by somebody that you like or whatever, and add it to your Christmas mixtape. But for the Halloween mixtape, yeah, it's like every three years I find a song, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like Jonathan Colton just came out with another slightly scary song that I can sort of shoehorn <laughs> in there, or you know, I I don't know. But I really do like spooky songs, songs that are about uh, stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it's like you buy the, they, they have those CDs that you can get sometimes. It's like scary Halloween songs. You get it. And it's all like the monster mash. And I, I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. Ancient, do you know that song? Yes, of course I know that song. What do you mean, of course? It's the, Al it's the Alvin and the Chipmunks song. Oh, all right. It's well beyond Halloween because of that. But yeah, it's it, ancient songs. Like the other day we were putting up our Halloween decorations, and I was like, oh, I'm going to put something on to decorate the house to. So I put on the Nightmare Before Christmas uh -huh. and started. And This Is Halloween is a great song for Halloween, but... They're all great songs. On it. Kidnap the Sandy Claus, oh, you know, yeah. or uh, Making, Making Christmas, Christmas la, la, la. or whatever. Yeah. It starts kind of like veering off course because it's the combination of the two, you know. The Boogie Woogie Man song is good, but s some of the other ones are kind of, uh, maybe they don't quite fit because of that whole mashup of the holidays. It was kind of weird when they were singing Making Christmas as we're decorating for Halloween. You know, it was just, it was just kind of weird. Um, maybe I need to make a Halloween playlist because I don't really have one. Just put Dead Man's Party on it. Yeah, there's a lot of Boingo Boingo on my... <laughs> but I just... Uh, there was a Dario Argento movie. His most famous movie was called Suspiria. And the, the music that is to that it's really a, a disturbing music and and it's kind of like a, a like a broken music box kind of thing mm -hmm. but then you hear these voices that seem to be like whispering
And I think basically what it is, is it's a bunch of Italians that don't really speak English, but they're saying things like, Yeah, and for some reason that's really disturbed. The broken English, where you make out a word here and, and the word witch comes out a bunch of times. Yeah, anyway, I, I remember having finding it difficult to listen to the Suspiria soundtrack with the lights <laughs> off. Where I was just like, okay, okay, let's go on to the next one. All right. Oh, it does your Halloween playlist have lots of just soundtrack music as opposed to songs with words? Yeah, because what can you do? I mean, there's so few songs. I mean, I, I really fudged a lot of songs in there. I put like The, the Ghost in You by Psychedelic Furs on there because it has freaking ghost in the, in the title and like four different versions of Don't Fear the Reaper and things like that. <laughs> but that's the, it's, it is what it is. Have you ever listened to the soundtrack to Coraline? No, but I'm not that twisted. <laughs> that one is really creepy, and it's the same kind of thing like you're talking about with the Italians saying whispering words that don't quite come through, and some of them do. With Coraline, they wanted words-sounding stuff in their in the music, but they didn't want it to be actual words so they basically they made up all these words and then had this creepy child choir singing them and they're just singing like and it's so creepy <laughs> That would have to go probably on my Halloween playlist if I was to have one. Um, no, I, I got to draw the line. I, I'm going to draw the line before Coraline on that. I'm sorry. That's that's too disturbing. They're too upsetting. <laughs> that should be on your Day of the Dead playlist <laughs> instead, which is a totally different holiday. I, I, you and I, the last time we went for a walk, I was telling you about um, a story that I wrote specifically for the Dune Steve that n never aired. It was witch-related. Uh, have we ever run a witch story on the show? I bet a woman I... called witch. <laughs> That's right. And well... We have um, run one very early on called A Woman Called Witch. There was another one where the main character's name was Feeling. Oh, and he no. had to fight against a witch in that story, too. I, and there may be Feeling. others. Jeez. There's probably others. Those two come immediately to mind, Feeling. though. Feeling. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was the worst name ever perpetrated on the Dune Steve, despite the fact that I purposely try and find ugly millennial-style names when I write my stories. Just, and yeah, you do really well, but you've never fun. sunk as low as feeling. But yeah, naming somebody feeling, that's just not right. Yeah, see, I, I think bullies are terrible, but I could financially support a bully that hurt somebody named feeling. <laughs> You would pitch into his Kickstarter campaign. Yes. Yeah. Help me beat up a nerd. Exactly. His name is Feeling. Oh, <laughs> how much do you need? Sign me up. You need money to buy a new baseball bat to beat him with? I broke Kickstarter. She's like, oh, shoot. We can't accept any more donations. There are only so many zeros in binary code. But anyway, you had a friend at work whose daughter was a professional actress. And you had told her... Okay, wait, wait, let me go back a little bit. We saw this girl on a movie that was coming out. We saw her in the trailer. She was a big part of the ad campaign. And you had mentioned, you know that girl? I know that girl's mom. I did her. And you said I did not to, say that, by the way. That was Rish adding that in just in case. You had said that at one time, you know, when you were fondling this woman. I did not. That you mentioned. I just, that's a, and it. Okay. You know, you looked across the bed to her and you said, <laughs> we do a podcast and, and often we'll have kids do the voices of kids. And your daughter happens to be both an actress and a kid. Is, am I telling the story even close to right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems and, like you're really more worried about throwing in sexual innuendos than telling the story right. So um, you're pretty much right on. It's late at night, guys. <laughs> I'm trying to keep people listening. Anyway, so as this woman is putting her pants on, she says, I think my daughter would be cool, would love to do that. That sounds really, really rad. And because I'm a Hollywood parent, 
I tell my daughter what to do because, you know, I didn't have a childhood and I'm going to take hers away and live vicariously through her. And she said, uh, yeah, sign her up. Whatever you want her to do, she will do. At any truth to that last statement at all? She did say that, right? Anything she you wanted to do? She said that she thought it would be fun. Anyway, you told me this and I was just like, oh, cool. And so I sat down and I wrote a story about a girl who discovers that her next door neighbor is a witch. And instead of, you know, saying, oh, this woman must be stopped, she became fascinated and she, you know, she wanted to learn, you know, what this woman had to teach. But then the girl went away and we never, I, I all I needed was just, a, a, you know, a little bit of push. And a lot of times you and I have this in common and maybe all creative people do. There's so many things competing for your time and for your attention, for your creative juices that... All you need is just somebody to say, hey, I want this or I need this or remember to do this, this one thing rather than all these other things. And you would focus on that one thing and get it done. But we never saw the girl again. Her, You never saw the mother again, as far as I can remember. Yes, yeah, yeah, they haven't gone back. So, you know, it just sort of fell by the wayside. And I never did run that story on the Dune, Steve. I never did share it with anybody. I don't think you've read it. I haven't, no. Um, Hearing what you've told just now about the story is about all I've ever heard of the story otherwise. You know, I, I think if we ever had run that story, I mean, obviously we would have talked about that we actually had a real actress and you can go see her in this movie and this movie or whatever as part of the show, because I think it was me. Not that, like, Julie Holverson isn't a real actress, but somebody where you could turn on a TV and say, that's the girl that whose voice I just heard on the Dune Steve. Then that we would have talked about that, but that I also we probably also would have talked about witchery and uh, Ouija boards and and you know this, this stuff and do hexes work and do you know are there spells and if 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 you went out to the woods and there were a bunch of naked chicks dancing around trees would you watch and uh, then you would lie and say no these are things that we would have talked about but because we never ran that I wouldn't story, just watch I'd get my phone out and videotape it oh see that's cool. <laughs> You'd be watching it through your phone, as people do. That's how you're supposed to experience life. <laughs> the worst period, generation period, <laughs> ever period. <clears throat> Anyhow, come to the last of the stories that my uncle told me that day. And it's only been a w- it's not even been a week since he told this thing to me. <clears throat> but as he was telling it, I this was the only one where I thought, oh... Shoot, man, how am I going to do this? And I, I called you afterwards or I texted you or something. And I said, you know, I wish that I had just been recording him because I'm not going to be able to do this justice because part of it was he started to transition between English and Spanish. And also part of just because he hearing it in the first person, I did this and I felt this and I thought this is better. It's stronger than he and he told, you know what I'm saying? Uh huh. The, when when we were doing the Urban Legends episode, you know, they're always a friend of a friend story because it would mean so much more if it was like, I did this and I saw this. But, you know, it's always kind of a, a distance that gives you, like, the possibility that all of this may be bullshit, that some of it may be true, that, you know, that, that all. But anyhow, my uncle is just so earnest that all of this is real and that these things happened to him. And that they're both terrifying and div in a way. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. They're just like, let me tell you what happened in our house. Almost in a way that he's proud of what has happened. You know, that, that because he recognizes that these are unique stories or these are things that don't happen to other people. That's right. my guess. But this one he didn't want to tell. Because I guess it was a bad thing. And he didn't like it. Whereas the creepy spirit showing up in the son's garage and slamming the door and stuff. That was a good thing. Well, it's not good, but he had said that, you know, it didn't, you know, it was alien. It was, it was other, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that made it scary, but he never felt like it wanted to hurt his son or any of that stuff. And I think if you got that impression that, that this thing that lives with you or, or these presences or whatever that are drawn to you, that they wanted to harm you, you wouldn't want to tell the stories anymore. Because he's like, you never know what might be listening. You right. know what I'm saying? Okay. Or it's like, you want to get the hell out of that house. Right. And and see, that's another thing, you know. So it goes back to the whole Eddie Murphy thing. It's just like, why do they stay in the house? You know, if this, if this were a brother that bought this house, 
Did I say oh, brother? I said a brother, sorry. <laughs> Wasn't it his thing where they found the head in the toilet? And he was saying, if it was a brother that found a head in the toilet, he'd be out the door before the toilet lid hit the seat. <laughs> it's like, wow, honey, this is, this place is beautiful. I want the curtains. Oh, too bad we can't stay, honey. Let's go to the car, right? Now. You know, kind of thing. And yeah, it kind of goes to back to what I was saying on the woman in black thing is, you know, they, you have to come up with a reason for people to stay. Because it's logical if something this awful happens, you go. Right. You run away from it. Anyway, I'm beating around the bush because I'm not sure if it's okay to tell this story, if it's going to sound as good. You know I, I, what I mean? When I say, oh, my uncle told this story that was weird, I can do weird. But if I say, my uncle told this story that was just like really scary, then suddenly it's on me to make it really scary. So people don't, don't go just, oh, come on, you had us going. And it was, it was basically another Rick roll, but not as clever. <laughs> he... Uh, said that this was about uh, 10 years ago, 2003, 2004, and he and his wife were not getting along. They were not, their marriage was no longer happy. It, it was hard for them to be with one another. And uh, he was unhappy all the time. And and he could tell that she was too. And, and you know, was, they, they could see the forest for the trees. They could see where, they, they could see that this, they, that it was almost over. That, you know, this is done. Maybe we're staying together for convenience. Maybe we're staying together for the kids, whatever it is. But it's it's not a good marriage anymore. And he would find himself staying away from the house, finding excuses to go other places, you know, go to his brothers to go, you know, I have to go pick the, do these errands or pick this stuff up. And, and I don't want to come back for a long time. And, and and I think anybody can understand that, you know, it's, it's not home anymore. It's just the place where you live. And... Uh, he said that there's this this area in Vegas that is known to have shops and little places that you can go that are uh, occult related. And one time he was he didn't want to go home and he went to this 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 area and there were these shops and there was you know like a fortune teller here and there was a you know herbal remedy place here and there was a you know a Chick Fil A here Ooh, wow. you know kind of thing. But he went in this shop. That was, shoot, there was some really benign way of saying charms and uh, blessings and that kind of stuff. He went in this thing and, and there was this woman behind the counter who, you know, was said, oh, I haven't seen you here before. What can I interest you in? And he's like, oh, I'm just I'm just looking. I'm not interested in anything really. And but he looked around and he said he didn't like the feel of the place. He didn't know what it was. The woman seemed pleasant enough and it was brightly lit. He said it wasn't like a scary, you know, like you'd see in a movie with, you know, skulls and ravens and all that stuff. And he's like, but I just, I walked in there and I was just like, ooh, I should turn around and leave. But the woman said, you know, is there, is there anything I can help you with? And, and he said, I have heard that you guys can do spells. And I, you know, I wonder, you know, is that stuff real? Does that stuff work? And she's like, yes, but you know, it, it it totally works. You know, we can do what whatever kind of spell that you want, but it's not cheap. It's going to cost, you know, a lot of money, and you have to actually believe in it for it to work effectively. And you know, if you're just here for a thrill or whatever, that's not gonna, it's not gonna do you any good. We'll still take your money, but you know, if you know, this place is these these are holy works or holy rites or whatever you want to call them, and you know, so they're not to be taken lightly and. And he's like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. I just, uh, you know, I've been having some relationship troubles and I, I just wondered if you had some. And she said, yeah, we, we have, we can do a, oh gosh, he had a name for it, like a casting or something like that. But it's going to cost you $972. Now he was specific, 972 Like this meant something. And I, it means nothing to me, this specific number. But it's like, that's how much it's going to be. You know, you have to make an appointment in advance. And, and let us know, you know, well in advance. And, and, and you need to bring something that belongs to, you know, I assume it's your wife, it's your girlfriend kind of thing. And uh, he's like, yeah, well, I was just curious kind of thing. And he left. But he said that he he kept thinking about it. He, that his wife wasn't the woman that he had married, you know, that, that, he, that he had wanted to spend the rest of his life with. She had changed. If if only there would be some way to make her like she was before. And so he decided 
okay, I'm going to get this money together and I'm going to do this. And he had called and talked to him and he was like, yeah, you guys said something about doing a, I can't remember what it was called, but it was going to cost $900. And they're like, oh, to do a casting, $972 is going to be. And they made this appointment and he said that he went in the bathroom and he got hairs from her hairbrush. And anyway, the whole time he's telling me the story, I'm just like, you are lying. <laughs> You you would never do any of this stuff. This was a weird thing. And this was when he took me aside. You know, he's like, you, you know, we're not going to tell her this. He says, because she doesn't know any of this ever happened. So he went there. And again, on this day that it was supposed to, he had this appointment. And it was the woman and then some older woman that was there. And the older woman explained that, you know, she was going to go and visit his wife. Not physically, but like project herself to visit the wife and she was going to influence her and say some words or whatever and everything was going to you know be better and you know she would be at one with nature and and you know that there are there are forces in the world and sometimes the forces get out of line and she was going to realign these forces in the way that they would have a a, a better re resolution and uh, anyway my uncle said i was there and i had this money and i was looking at this woman and the whole time, like every instinct was saying, you need to get out of here. This is not cool. This is not a, this is no good is going to come from this. And you're going to be $972 poorer. Even if nothing happens, you're going to feel stupid. Get out. This is, you know, but he, he, he wouldn't do it. He stayed there and the woman said, you know, okay, are you, you know, prepared and, you know, give me what you're supposed to give me. And, and, uh, I don't know why he, he added these details, but he, he said that the woman told him not to touch her, that he had to give the money and give the hair or whatever to the younger woman. The woman, the, the actual witch was not to be bought, uh, touched or, or, you know, interfered with while she was doing this. And, and he explained that she was actually supposed to astrally project herself to his wife where her, like her presence could be felt, but not seen. Anyhow, they did this thing, and it was like a prayer or whatever, and uh, the woman just started to say stuff, and, and I said, well, what was this woman? You know, like, race has anything to do with it, but it was like, she was just a woman. She was just, you know, a gray-haired woman, and the stuff she was saying was in English. It wasn't, you know, some nonsense language or any of that stuff, uh, and then it was done. You know, this thing was done, and she had my money, and she like, you know go and and peace be with you or whatever you know and you know where we are if things work out the way that, that they're supposed to then you know you spread the word you tell other people about us kind of thing and, and he said i i drove home and i i couldn't listen to the radio or anything like that i was just disgusted with myself he's like why had i done this and and his only justification is that he was desperate that he he didn't want his marriage to end he he still a part of him still loved his wife even though it was like the the there's dark at the end of the tunnel we are going to split up so he gets home and immediately like his wife rips into him you're like where have you been you were supposed to be home you know i called george and george said you left work at four o'clock and, and he's like it was exactly what it had always been you know, he said, honey, I, I, I just, you know, I just had to clear my head or whatever. It's going to, it's, uh, you know, I'm here now. And he just said that, you know, let me put this behind me and just pretend that this never happened. And I, I'll never tell her that I did this. He's like, I'm just going to make the effort myself to, you know, to make my marriage better. But, the, you know, whatever he said to her, she just got more and more upset and more angry. And she started to yell at him. You know, she started calling him names and, and all this stuff and, you know, accused him of going out and being, you know, with other women and, you know, that she, she wanted to go home. She wanted to go back to her country and, you know, she, she had never wanted to be here. You know, her, you know, he had taken her away from all that. And, you know, this is said that eventually she started saying all this stuff and I, he got really defensive and, you know, it's like, where would you be without me? And he started to yell and he said at, at again, dude, I, I don't know if I should be telling this story. He said, yeah, that's far along. all of a sudden, he said, I'm going to put my hands around her throat and I'm going to just choke her. And he saw himself doing it and just choking her and choking her until she was dead. 
he said it felt like somebody had splashed him with ice cold water. He was just like, he took a step back and he's just like, whoa, where did that come from? Holy crap. And as soon as he did that, she started to freak out. And he thought she saw in my eyes, I was going to kill her. Uh, she saw that. And he started to apologize and he realized it wasn't him that she was afraid of. She started to shriek and scream. And he said it was like a little kid crying and inconsolate. And she was pointing and he turned and there was nothing there. And he just put his arms around her and he's like, I'm so sorry. And he said, you know, let's get down on our knees and let's pray. And we'll ask for forgiveness for the things that we've done. And I'm so sorry. And everything, you know, it's like, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right kind of thing. And she calmed down and she, he said, what did you see? And she said, La Santa Muerte was in the room. The, 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 the saint of death is what that is in Spanish. You know, from, that's a big thing in, in South America and all that stuff. And so I, I pictured the Grim Reaper or whatever when, when he said that she said that, which is fine. But then he says, no, you don't understand. Not El Santo Muerte. A woman death was in the room. And he says, to this day, I never told her that I went to a witch. And she said that she had projected herself into it. That's what Virginia was seeing. And anyhow, he told this story and there's all the other stories had a big smile at the end or wasn't that cool. And oh, cool. I bet you can't wait to put that in your podcast and all that. This one did not. And he, you know, he again said, don't tell her. She doesn't know any of that stuff. All these years, you know, we got better. Our, we, you know, we're close again. Everything's good and all that stuff. And again, it's kind of like Marshall or uh, Gino or uh, Adam telling us these, these stories. It takes something to share something intimate. And, uh, I hope I've done justice to his telling because again, he was, you just know, there was no humor at all. It was almost as though he had been holding this in and he wanted to tell somebody this, this story. And, uh, it does have a happy ending because, you know, they're still together and they seem happy now. And then they rode 500 miles on a motorcycle together, which <laughs> seems like, you know, that's pretty close. I, I don't know that I would do that with, uh, you know, anyone other than Brian Lincoln. And so that's, this, this, that was the last story that he told for, you know, this, uh, this podcast thing. And, uh, anyhow, I, I'll stop and ask you what you think of the story and whether you think maybe I should have kept that one to myself. I don't know that you needed to keep it to yourself or not. Your uncle told you it knowing that that was your plan to begin with and he didn't seem to think that it mattered i mean it's not something that he shared with her but he doesn't worry at all that she's ever going to hear it by way of this so it's probably not a big deal it's like a friend of a friend of a friend story really these people that are hearing it they, they don't know any of the people involved and so it's probably not a big deal but yeah, I don't know. It was a creepy story. Definitely. Yeah, I just, I don't know, imagining someone that has actually done that. You know, I've read stories where people have done things like that or listened to them on podcasts or whatever. But they're all fictional stories, or at least mostly fictional. I've seen movies where people have done this stuff. But to know about someone who has done it in real life, it's it's interesting and very very strange. It makes me wonder, though, what it was all about, you know? This casting or whatever was supposed to fix their relationship. It didn't seem like there was anything whatsoever involved with that other than she, maybe the witch was somehow getting him to want to kill her? I, well, yeah, it's it's open to interpretation. I My interpretation is he opened a door to forces that are only bad. You know what I mean? It was in the guise of this is going to help you guys, but it was really just, you know, let's dabble in the occult and see where it goes. Uh -huh. that, that, I think that's the lesson that I got from it. But it, of course, you know, he may give me a totally different explanation. And, and yeah, if you want to put a really lovely spin on it, yes, they're together because of this terrible thing. 
I don't know. The, there's there's a lot of like disturbing parts of that story. I mean, the part that really bothered me was that it was a woman in the room that she saw a woman, and and just the 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 idea that he wanted to strangle her, and that he would admit that to me, seemed. I don't know. It it just seemed like okay, hey, I may not be worthy to hear this story from you. <laughs> That that's too intimate a story to tell, uh-huh. especially because you know I can't be trusted. I've just shared it with six other people, you know, you <laughs> and the five people that listen to this show. But it's like you used to tell me things, and I'd always wonder well, why did he tell me? Because he knows I'm going to put that in a story, like intimate things about you and your marriage and stuff like that. And some of them I haven't put into them into a story, but I yes. will put it into the podcast here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting conundrum whether you should have shared that or not. I guess it's probably too late because it's shared. And the five people that are listening to the show are going to know this story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. It, it seems like it smacks of desperation, too. It's like I, I so needed filler for these episodes that I was willing to go to a witch story. <laughs> a woman called... Which? <laughs> Not which. Which. <laughs> that was your first time you used your old lady voice on the podcast ever. Was it? It was before the, the Chinese one? Yeah, it was way before. That was within the first issue of the Doonesty <laughs> Fadio Fiction magazine. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of the show, unless you have more to say about the story. Well, I don't. I, I, I think I probably should have stopped before the whole, uh, is it okay? What is it? what I think the story means? But it is a story, and now it's out there. And, they, you know, they're always better if it really happened to me kind of thing. And so that's that's cool. I mean, you know, he could be like this fantastic storyteller, this fantastic liar. And just make these things up on the spot. And if so, that's a real talent. Because I always believe they really happen to him. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Some, there are people that are like that, which is a sad thing. I was actually best friends with a guy in grade school. And he would just lie for no reason even. There was no reason whatsoever. He'd just make crap up all the time and tell it to me. And I would... I mean, for one thing, I was in grade school, so... Why wouldn't I believe it? Kids believe everything you tell them. So it wasn't until years later when I'd think about something that he'd said and I'd be like, what? that was total crap. Why would he even say that? And what is the point of lying about something dumb like that? And my wife tells me that she had a friend that was like that too, where he was just a compulsive liar. He would lie about what he had for breakfast. People were like, yeah, I had this for breakfast. What'd you have? And he'd make something up. He'd be like, I had... Uh, eggs when what he really had was cereal why would you say something else about what you had for breakfast I mean if you ate 15 bowls of cereal and you want to only say you ate one I guess I can understand lying about that so you don't sound like some kind of a glutton but why would you just lie and say I had eggs instead of I had cereal but he would do that kind of crap all the time to the point where he just, you couldn't talk to him because all he would do is lie so there are people like that out there. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that your uncle is one of them, but you never know. It could be it could be possible. So maybe that's the kind of thing that entertains him, seeing you buying it. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, it's, obviously, I don't know the guy whatsoever, so I have no frame of reference for it. Well, hopefully people enjoyed it and thought, you know, that it was a scary story, even if, you know, it's like totally fictional and it never actually happened. You know, it, it just filled another episode. <laughs> and that's all and that matters. It is. I, I You know, we've, we've done this thing again. And you keep saying it's the 13th annual. <laughs> but as far as I know, this is the third year that we've done 13 episodes in a row. And uh, it's, it's, it's work. I don't think that this is tied to a, like, donation drive or anything like that. But again... We appreciate people's donations and we appreciate people saying that they like the show and telling other people about it, going on iTunes, you know, any of these things. Just 
posting on Facebook or reposting, you know, that the show aired and, and that you liked it. It does suck that there are only five people that listen, but there are five good people. Yeah, if you're one of the people that are listening, you're one of the five good people. So take that to heart. That's Rish's compliment for you today. Well, if you do feel inclined to donate, um, we won't turn it down for sure. There's the buttons on the website that you can donate five bucks a month with, five bucks a quarter with, or just name your own donation and just do a one-time thing. Those donations are really helpful. Help us to... uh, keep everything going on the show and yeah uh i guess we'll finish it up there i'm big ankovich and i'm rich outfield and i end with something clever i just said it's not a like, nice one it's like a callback to earlier in the show see what i did there wow that was a good one way to go dude see you next time folks That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, no derivatives license. That means you can copy it, share it, and make paper dolls out of it. But you can't sell it or use it in your little voodoo rituals. I'm talking to you, sir. For the night is dark and full of terrors. For the night is dark and full of terrors. Oh, no!